No matter what kind of car you are into, we all know the MX-5, Miata, whatever the hell you want to call it, is one of the most perfect cars on the planet because it's one of the most balanced. So when there are changes on the horizon, even small changes, we absolutely have to discuss them. Now, as we kick things off today, I'm certain there's a subset of you scratching your head thinking, what the hell are you talking about? The Miata, yes, it's been around since 2016, but I don't know of any changes. Well, unless you went and combed Japanese enthusiast websites, the media site in Japan for Mazda, or some of the enthusiast sites here in the US, Miata has been quietly updated with a mid-cycle refresh that they're calling the ND3. Now that brings us to the obvious question, ND3, what the hell are you talking about? Well, ND for the obvious generation of car that this is, and 3 is the variation or version of it. So what changes do make up the ND3? I would argue they fall into like three buckets. There's some visual changes, there's some color and trim changes, and then there's some engineering and technical changes. Let's start with some of the bits on the outside of the car. The body, it looks very much the same. Now let's step back a little bit and discuss what a mid-cycle refresh is. Remember the Cayenne, the 24 Cayenne we recently drove? That is a mid-cycle refresh. The car is effectively the same underneath. They just changed the front rear. In that case, they made major changes to the engine. Here, this is also a mid-cycle refresh. Not as many changes to this as they did with the Cayenne. So, what changes on the outside? Well, up front, the big difference are the headlights. They're LEDs now, and the daytime running lamps change. Then, to match that, they go with LEDs in the rear. So, it's a way of cleaning up the way the car looks in the front. I would argue it takes away some of those goofy lights off to the side of the current car and makes it a more organic shape, especially in the light housing. Now, huge point here, everything we're discussing is currently available in the JDM market, but the reality is what we're seeing here, the ND2 is still gonna soldier on to the end of the year. I'm guessing if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, we'll see this ND3 most likely in March of next year. I'm kind of reading Coleman's face when I talk to him. Of course, he never confirms anything because he's not allowed to tell me specific things until they're announced, but the way his face contorted I'm betting March is definitely that time. Then what's a mid-cycle refresh without new wheel designs? Huge point here, we do not lose the BBS wheel package. At least according to some of the photographs I've seen supplied by Mazda Japan, I know the way things are between the different countries, the different product managers spec things on their own. I'm seeing these all over. This is a club. I'm seeing them all over, so I would be shocked if they didn't offer us the club here again in the U.S., which has the BBS wheels and the Recaro seats, I want to point out. And that brings us to some of the changes on the inside, and here they fall into two buckets. There's one that's very obvious, and there's one that was absolutely necessary. Let's start with the obvious, and it would be the screen. You look at this, this ND2, the screen. It looks like an iPhone 2, at least in size. This one is not touch sensitive. Now hear me out, I am not a big fan of touch screens because as we've learned from Coleman over many years, where your fingers go, where your eyes go, which means they're less safe. I am a big believer in this unified controller that Mazda and BMW have used to work in conjunction with these screens. I'm guessing they're changing that here in this car. I can't confirm that yet. What I can confirm, the screen's now bigger. It's 8.8 .8 inch diagonal. It does look better in the car. And my guess is they're bringing a new suite of technology. Some of the stuff we have to wait to talk about because they show the JDM car. It has some bits that you and I, let's just say not really conducive to Miata. And then some that's kind of new to a car like this. Like for example, radar cruise control is now part of the whole safety sense, whatever they call it at Mazda. And I'm guessing that's wrapped up into this new screen. Then we get to the thing that was absolutely necessary, more colors. You know, you look at this car, actually I'm one of the few people that likes this color. I love the soul red crystal. But the interiors, they've done such a good job with the design of this interior where they bring the exterior color to the inside and the top of the door panels. But the thing that they just didn't go all the way on, black interior. 
especially like you go and you get the Recaro seats, which look magnificent, but it's kind of a Sophie's choice when you go to the club. It's either Recaro seats or a better color interior. That sort of is changing because this new ND3, they at least show this supple tan interior, but more importantly, a tan top to go with it. And if I'm seeing these pictures correct, it looks like there's a brown dash to go with the tan interior. Again, can't confirm that because it could be the way the sun is hitting the dashboard. Maybe it's black and it's just my eyes. I'm hoping that it's like a very like chocolatey brown to contrast with a tan interior because that was really the only thing that was missing on the interior of these cars. Yeah, they're tight, a little bit better in an ND, but some of the details they put in it, like the Recaro seats or the satin finished trim, do take a car that frankly 30 grand and it feels better than 30 grand on the inside. And that brings us to some of the technical changes. First stop would be the smart brake support. See what I did there? This effectively is an emergency braking system. They've got that in other Mazdas. Pretty much every other car manufacturer has a version of this. And effectively, when you're not paying attention, the car will do an emergency brake. Now they're going to transition it into the Miata. And that brings us to the changes that make this an MX-5, Miata, whatever the hell you want to call it. First would be a change in the limited slip differential. There's a whole bit of mumbo jumbo on the JDM site about an asymmetrical limited slip differential. And the way they've described it, if I'm getting this correctly, there is more force on the decelerating side of the car. That is all I can share with you now until we actually test it to understand what it does. But that, I think, was brought about because they've made some other changes. Like, for example, the e-pass system here, they've taken some friction off the rack. And if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, all of this is going to work in conjunction with a change to the stability control system where they've added a track mode. Again, if I'm looking into this and trying to decipher what the engineers are telling me, they're raising the limits of intervention so they can make this an even more manual, authentic. Perhaps a better way to put this would be a more analog experience when it comes to driving dynamics, but we gotta put a pin in that until we actually drive the car. And that brings us to one of the most obvious questions of this whole discussion. What about the engine? And there you know the answer to this. It's a balanced car, not a powerful car. So still the same two engines on offer. Remember the JDM car is the 1.5. There's also a two liter there and we only get the two liter here. Uh, they're promising an additional four horsepower. So not a whole hell of a lot to discuss. They talked about rev bands, how the power is arrived. But again, we gotta wait until we actually drive the car to see if it makes a difference. My guess, it's more about sharper driving dynamics than it is about power. Okay, so those are all the notable changes, but now we need to switch the discussion to the overall business of Mazda. Why do we need to do that? because Mazda has changed substantially since this car was introduced in 2016. For example, the CX-90. That is a $40,000 base price. They go up to about $60,000, $63,000. Most of them are transacting in the 50s to low 60s range. But here's the important point. They are selling now about 5,000 units a month. Why is this important to you? When a car, at least the base price of the car, goes over forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, the volume usually halves. And when you're dealing with like a Mazda, especially the CX-9, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't the best one out there, they barely sold any. Which means if a car company is not selling the volume cars in volume, they can't take that R&D budget from those sales and apply it to cars like this that sell like three year. Yeah, I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. Now, I will admit I was blown away by the CX-90, more so the inline six than the plug-in hybrid, not so much there, but even I'm blown away again that they're selling so many of them at a high price, but then we've got to switch the discussion to the real volume cars, the cars that pay the real freight at Mazda. That's clearly the CX-5, the CX-50, and the CX-30. Previously, it was just the CX-5, that's at least when this car came out. Now there's two other volume cars. Again, why is this important? Because they can take that budget and apply it 
to the next generation of Miata. Now, while we're on that topic, I'm sure many of you have seen that stunning concept car that Mazda showed in Japan. As someone who owned an FC RX-7, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, can that be an RX-7? I will absolutely, positively buy one, provided it's at least some sort of gasoline something. I'll do hybrid, but I will not do full electric. We can discuss that in the comments below. But some of you have seen in some of the discussions, at least the forums, you're thinking that's the new Miata. I'm willing to bet it isn't because the size of the vehicle, the proportions don't say Miata to me. Maybe some of the design language will make it to the next generation Miata. But that car, it is, it is so, so sexy. So put another way. Mazda we've talked about for the past couple of years, they're going up market, they're competing with BMWs, and you and I kind of scratched our head and said, really, you know, is someone gonna say no to a BMW and the dealership experience to buy a Mazda? And that's where Mazda has been changing. If you believe some of their press, they say that a number of the volume cars are being sold through the new dealerships that have invested into a better experience. You know. I, I'm a Lexus guy. I didn't buy the Lexus for the dealership experience, but now that I've experienced what it's like to go into a dealer like that, I get it. I see why people say no to certain cars because they know they have, the dealer's got their back and Mazda, I still feel they've got some ways to go there. Okay, so yes, I'm going off on a business tangent, but here's how it connects back to the Miata. If you are a business owner, meaning you own a car dealership, seven years ago, you only had one car paying the bills for everything, the CX-5. Here you are in 2023 going into 2024, and you have four cars paying the bills, all volume cars, CX-90, CX-5, CX-50, and CX-30, which means you can invest more money back into the facility, employees, basically, make it a better experience for real car people to buy a better car from you. So now you see how this all connects here, but I am just one man. And this is the point of the episode that I turn around to you guys. But here I'm gonna give you two missions. Mission number one, what are some of the changes you wanna see in the next generation of Miata? And number two, our dear Mr. Coleman. He has promised to do a how and why episode on the plug-in CX-90, but he's working on something special and he will not tell me. I'm guessing it's probably an RX-7 or new Miata because they got him going all over the place and he just has no time to socialize like he once did. So how about we have a Dave Coleman joke writing contest. And here's how the contest is gonna go. You guys write the jokes about Coleman. Could be something about him being the only one foolish enough to shoehorn a motorcycle engine into a Miata and race it, or that he's just old and grumpy. I don't care what it is, comments below, write your Coleman jokes. The best Coleman joke that is picked out by Coleman and his wife gets a part that has been discarded from one of his many cars that he will sign. Now, has Coleman officially agreed to provide these fabulous cash and prizes? Not exactly, but I intend to make him an offer he can't refuse. And if you like this episode, I would highly suggest you watch an episode that is the absolute opposite end of the spectrum here. We recently drove the Lamborghini Huracan Starato. That was an unusual surprise and unexpected in many ways. Don't judge that book by its cover. You can check out that episode here. Until I see you in the next episode, bis später.